Please be seated. Those victims are not only United States victims. They are global victims. Another sign to the cost of terrorism and the obligation of the free world to fight terrorism. Because if we are not going to fight it now, we are going to pay high price later, and the price will go higher and higher. It was May 2001 when the siren uh, caught me in the Israeli Air Force headquarters. I was the commander of the Air Force. And siren means that something wrong start to happen. Three, uh, three minutes later, I was down in the uh, command station, and uh, I was told that an uh, intruder is going to cross the Israeli airspace coming from Lebanon, and uh, we don't know anything about him. We are tracking him. And I ordered to launch uh, a pair of F-16 to escort this intruder. Uh, they found him crossing the border nearby Roshani Kreis, the northern point of uh, Israel along the seashore, along the Mediterranean. And uh, the pilot reported to me that it's a light airplane with a single pilot. And uh, I asked them to escort him and to see what's going on. The first thing that crossed my mind was Tel Aviv. I thought that uh, unknown airplane, he is not identifying himself, not answering to the call to the radio calls, etc. Means that he has something in his mind which is not according to our plans. Uh, the F-16 leader told me that uh, he's flying too slow for F-16, and I ordered to launch a pair of Apache helicopter. And 15 minutes later, they escorted him along the seashore and reported on every single move of the pilot and the airplane. And uh, such an event is a nightmare of any commander because uh, you are in a dilemma. Uh, are you going to shoot an innocent airplane or you are not going to shoot a hostile airplane? And to shoot down a light airplane, uh, that's not something that we are happy to do on a daily basis. And uh, only on very rare occasion we are trying to do, we are doing those things. Anyhow, the, the first thing that crossed my mind was that someone went to suicide in, in the middle of Tel Aviv. And I asked General Mofaz, who was my commander, I was the chief of the Air Force, he was the chief of staff, to get approval from the prime minister. And when the approval, approvals received, I told him that I'm going to shut him down once he's going to enter to the circle of 20 miles from Tel Aviv. And the approval was given. And uh, when he came, he crossed the 20 uh, miles line, I ordered to shut him down, and he was shut down by the Apache helicopter. It was my May 2001. That was kind of routine of the Israeli Air Force to be ready against any unidentified aerial threat and to shoot him down. The first, the first event happened in 1972. A Libyan passenger airplane was shot down. It was a mistake. And 162 uh, civilians were killed. On this, on this case in 72. It was found as a mistake later, but it was a mistake. It was four o'clock in the afternoon, and we were discussing uh, Air Force activities against the Palestinians on September 11, 2001, when one of my officers came to my office and told me that an airplane collided into one of the twins. I stopped the session. We went to the breaking news, and uh, it was obvious. It's not a collision. 
It's a terror attack. I told this morning that one of the first conclusion, and it came day after the September 11, was to restructure the plans or replan the plans for the Israeli Air Force headquarters and instead of 28 stories building, we reduced it to 18 just to reduce the signature of the building uh, as a headquarter. September 11 changed the world. And I think that the uh, outcomes of this terror attack are still valid, and it will take years to, to come to the conclusion that it's over, if it will be over. I don't think that terror is going to vanish from the world. Terror is an everlasting phenomena, and as long as people live on earth, we will find terrorism in this way or another. And terrorism is not, it's not new to us, but ideologic, ideological terrorism and fundamental Islam terrorism is relatively new to us. Relatively, not to those who have good memory, but relatively new to us. The Islamic Brotherhood was founded around 90 years ago, in 1920 in Egypt. And the target of those radical Muslim organization is to control the world, in a way, at least to convert us. And I believe that most of us don't want. Democracies has the right to survive. And democracies has to fight in order to survive. Because I think that the fight is not between terrorists and non-terrorists. The fight is between culture, religion, tradition, way of life, and if we want to keep our way of life, of freedom, of free market, of free society, the right to move, the right to, to express ourselves, etc., 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 we have to stand up and to fight back. And I think the State of Israel is doing it for the last 63 years of independence, and we are not tired of it, because the alternative doesn't exist. So we have to continue and do it until we'll achieve a status quo which is acceptable to us. And I think that the rest of the world should do it. <clears throat> and the rest of the world, I'm mainly speaking about the Western community. In the last few weeks, we saw some examples in the southern part of the country how few terrorists of the Islamic Jihad throw into shelters one million people in Israel. And Beersheba became the heart of the targets and it caused one fatal and the few people who were injured, injured but most important, the opening of the summer semester was delayed. And the, the, the opening was done uh, by incident. My daughter-in-law is a student in uh, Beersheba University, and she told me we are going to Jerusalem for the opening day. Why? Because terror is trying to change our way of life, and we cannot accept it. Eight Israelis were murdered, were killed. And it opened a new window to a new front that was quiet in the last 30-something years, which is the Egyptian one. The peace with Egypt is a strategic asset to Israel, and the same is to Egypt. But no doubt 
that in the last few months since Mubarak moved from his position unwillingly, but he was forced to do it, something is going wrong there. I want to believe that the, the goal or the, the interest of the Egyptian is the same as the Israelis, so I believe. But no doubt that we have to watch, we have to keep an eye, and we have to help the Egyptian to help us to help them. It's a circle. And uh, we should enable, as the government took a decision to do, to uh, bring more forces, Egyptian forces, into uh, Sinai Peninsula, you know, to block some of their activities which are taking place over there. Egypt is important, but we saw yesterday what was the distance between happy hand and tragedy. And the distance was a door that was kept closed a few minutes more than they wanted it to be closed. Uh, and I don't want to think what would have been the results if something would have gone very wrong in the Cairo uh, embassy, Israeli embassy. But the entire region is not stable. It's not only Egypt. We saw what's, what's happening with the Turks. We saw what happened in Libya. We saw what happened in Tunisia. Uh, we saw what's going on in, we see what's going on in Syria. And uh, we have the September 20, which is another September uh, date to be remembered by us at least, the Israelis, when the Palestinians are going to bring the, their resolution to the General Assembly in uh, New York, UN General Assembly. This instability uh, is not the right time to speak about hope and future, a bright future, but I think that we must speak about it because uh, otherwise it's very easy to be pes pessimistic in, uh, in, uh, in the Mid Middle East. And you know, to be optimistic, you have to hop, to have a hop, and to find every single sign of light and magnify it in order to find solution. I believe that we should have an iron fist when we are addressing terrorism, but the same very hand should be handed to find peaceful solution. The question if there is other side to negotiate, this question must be asked, but we are obliged to look constantly for alternatives rather than military conflict, rather than uh, using force. Because force by itself is not solving problem, it's freezing the situation at the most. It's not changing situation. It's not creating alternative, not political alternative. Beersheba University, or Ben Gurion University, is the heart of the Negev. It's part of the vision of David Ben Gurion, and no doubt that education, and high education mainly for Israel, is the most important thing. We have only one natural resources, which is the human factor, or the human being. Lately, we found some uh, gas fields uh, or in, in the Mediterranean, but gas come and go. The human, the human being always stays. And we need them because we know what the Israeli brains brought to the world, what the Jewish brains brought to the world. And it's based mainly on education, high education, advanced education, sophisticated education, and education which is directed to the southern part of the country first, 
but more than that, in, it's directed to develop this part of the country because education brings people, people bring industry, and highly educated people bring culture and bring transportation and bring everything. And no doubt that nowadays Ben-Gurion University is counted as one, I would say, one or two. There is a debate among the youngsters, but I think it's attractive university to the youngsters. And that's the biggest achievement, because I remember myself when I studied in Tel Aviv University, Ben-Gurion University was not exist. Uh, or started to to educate. Nowadays, there is no question. When you want a good education, you are going there. And one thing that I want to say from my point of view is that uh, Ben Gurion University is integrating many newcomers into the academic life of Israel. And uh, that's something which is very, very important regarding the integration of society. Uh, <clears throat> so any single penny which in, is invested in high education pays high dividend, very high dividend, and we have many proof for that. The nature of wars, it changed. Those who are looking for a knockout campaigns that will uh, uh, delete terrorism of Earth are going to be frustrated. It won't happen. It takes more than uh, 10 years in Afghanistan. It took us more than five years for the second intifada. It took us uh, uh, more than five years for the first intifada. And uh, we stayed 18 years in Lebanon in the first round, etc., etc. Those campaigns are long. And uh, there is no miracle. We, we need passion. We need a lot of air in our lungs in order to be able to cope with uh, terrorism. I think that the Americans are doing the right things when they are fighting terrorism. I think that they are doing it, that they are learning step by step, mission by mission, operation by operation. And persistence that was shown in the chase after bin Laden, that's something that should be remembered as part or as a as a nucleus of fighting terrorism, we have to run after the leaders. We have to run after the leaders, and if the leaders pass the, passing away, the second row, and the third row, and the fourth row, one by one, one by one, they should feel personally that they are tracked day and night all over the year. That's the only way, because terrorism by itself has no property, has no land, has no country to lose. And they are paying the price by sacrificing their population. They are not paying personal price. The population that they are living in or within are paying the prices. We should terrorize terrorism. And we have to understand that, at least from my point of view, I have nothing against Islam and nothing against the uh, Muslim religion. Many of my friends that are living in Israel, Israeli Arabs, a very good person. They are looking for a peaceful life. They want to live. And many of the Muslims in the world are people who are looking for a peaceful life. But they are a minority, which is... Uh, taking the Islam to, to corners or to points or to uh, uh, distances that the founders of this religion never meant. The Arab Spring, just a few uh, uh, sentences. I think that too many are too excited from too little. Uh, I don't think that uh, the Arab countries will be transformed into democracies. And if it will happen, it will take hundreds of years. It, it, it won't take months, not few years. 
because it's a matter of culture, education, tradition, tribes, etc., etc. And the fact is that 22 Arab countries, none of them is a democracy. And it's not by incident. So it won't happen very soon. It will take a long time. So all those who are expecting that we'll see out of this spring democracy is all over, I think they're going to be uh, disappointed, to say the least. From the Israeli perspective, I think that uh, we have now to wait and see how all those turbulences in the Middle East will end. That's not the time for us to run forward with peace agreement with this and with that and with uh, number three and number four and there are a few on the line. We have to be ready to continue with the Syrians and Lebanese and all the rest once we'll understand that the turbulences are over. Not now. With the Palestinians, a different issue, but that's something that will be clear to us very soon when we see whether the whole world is shifting towards the Palestinians or not. I personally believe that on the September 20, we'll see a vast majority supporting the Palestinians, but nothing will happen the day after. We don't have to worry that the day after the sky will fall, the sun will continue to rise, and everything will continue as it was, but it's part of a process that in the end will lead them to a state. The two-state solution was declared. I don't think that we can withdraw from that. What we can is to adjust the solution that will fit our needs, our future needs, and our existence in Israel. Just to summarize, I would say that Israel must look for ways to solve the Palestinians or any other one who is ready to discuss with us in a peaceful way. Israel should be kept a Jewish and democratic state. I didn't elaborate about the Israeli internal demographic issues but by saying Jewish and democratic state, we have to keep our country as a democratic and Jewish country. And third, we must reset our national priority list. Uh, that's an outcome of what we saw on the last few weeks in Israel, or last two months in Israel, Defense by itself cannot justify the imbalance in the Israeli society. When the distance between the pillars is too big, and we have to adjust our structure, the society structure, and society uh, balances and mainly to support the middle and low, and low classes. All those three topics connected to one root, which is resources. And resources are built on a strong economy. So, on top of all those, we have to continue to build our strong economy, and that's connecting us to Ben Gurion University, to higher education, and to the area that we can contribute more to the Israeli economy, which is the high-tech community, the medical community, etc., etc., etc. Thank you, and I want to wish you and your families Shana Tova and uh, good evening. Thank you very much, General.